Hi everyone. High cholesterol levels affect millions of people worldwide and remain a significant risk factor for heart disease. Roughly 1 in 250 of these cases are genetically inherited. In this video, we will go through a case study providing a step-by-step -step approach to this condition. We will also discuss how to diagnose familial forms of hypercholesterolemia, FH, and the challenges we face in treating this condition. I hope you find it informative. Our patient is a young, cheerful man who recently migrated to this country with his young family. He exercises regularly, doesn't smoke, and has no diabetes or hypertension. He takes no medications. A few years after settling, he decided to apply for life insurance. As part of the workup, he was asked to do a blood test, which revealed striking results. His total cholesterol was 12 millimoles per liter, with an LDL cholesterol level of 10.5 millimoles per liter. When you encounter an abnormal lipid profile like this, it's crucial to take a step-by-step -step approach. This ensures we don't overlook any significant diagnosis. Here's how I break it down into five clear steps. One, repeat the test and confirm the results. Keep familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, in mind. It's easy to miss if you're not looking for it. Two, look over any previous blood tests. Three, detailed family history. Four, physical examination. And five, use the FH calculator. Let's walk through these steps with our patient. To confirm the initial results, he had another fasting blood test. The second test was performed at a different lab and the results were consistent with the first one. With such high cholesterol levels, it's important to rule out the so-called secondary causes of hypercholesterolemia, such as chronic kidney disease, thyroid issues like hypothyroidism, or specific high-fat diets such as the keto diet. Other tests for our patient returned normal, and he was not following any unique diet. At this point, it's important to consider FH right from the start, as it can be easily overlooked. Reviewing past results is essential, even if they're from many years back. For example, if blood tests from two years ago were normal, I'd focus on secondary causes of high cholesterol. However, consistent high readings over the years would strongly suggest FH. I would make every effort to gather any blood test data available, whether recent or from the distant past or done in a different lab. In this case, he didn't have any blood tests since his migration, and unfortunately, he didn't have access to his old results. To show you the importance of reviewing the old blood test results, consider this case that I visited recently, a 53-year-old patient with palpitations, which turned out to be benign. However, I noticed she has been on simvastatin 20 mg for the last 10 to 15 years. Her current lipid profile showed total cholesterol of 5 and LDL cholesterol of 3.3 millimoles per liter. At this point, a reasonable question is that what would her LDL cholesterol be if she was not taking simvastatin? There is a calculator to answer that question. Search LDL cholesterol adjustment in Google. If you scroll down, you will see this link that says, what would be your cholesterol level if? Click on that and you will be taken to the HeartCare Sydney website, or you can directly go to the HeartCare Sydney website and navigate to calculators and LDL level adjustment. Here you enter the LDL cholesterol level, either in millimoles per liter or milligrams per deciliter. In our case, it is 3.3 millimoles per liter, and then choose the medication the patient was taking when the blood was drawn. In our case, simvastatin 20 milligrams. You will get an estimate of the LDL cholesterol if the patient was not taking the medication. In this case, her LDL cholesterol would be 5.3 millimoles per liter. At first glance, these figures might seem acceptable, but they don't paint the whole picture. Firstly, we should ask ourselves why she was prescribed a statin 15 years ago. A look into her family history reveals a concerning pattern. Her mother and one brother had bypass surgery at 60. Her father suffered a heart attack at 65 during a stress test, 
and her younger brother has severe coronary disease at 50 under medical treatment. Now, the scenario is changing. Here, we look at her past blood tests. As we can see, going back to 2014, results appear unremarkable. However, when we go further back when she was not on a statin, the picture starts to appear. For example, in 2003, at the age of 33, her total cholesterol was 7, and LDL cholesterol was 5.5 millimoles per liter, a consistent pattern through many years. Now, the combination of the family history and past lipid levels strongly suggests a genetic predisposition to hypercholesterolemia. She was never informed about this possibility, which has significant implications for her and her children. She had a genetic test, which confirmed FH. In light of these findings, her current LDL cholesterol level of 3.3 is far from optimal, and she requires aggressive medical and lifestyle interventions to prevent a cardiac event. Going back to our original case, unfortunately, no old results were available, so we moved on to the next step in our approach, which is taking a detailed family history. Taking a detailed family history with open questions is crucial. I specifically ask about every single family member as these events can be forgotten, especially if they happened in the distant past. I would ask about a history of heart attack, stenting, bypass surgery, or sudden cardiac death at an early age in any family member. For example, in the case of our patient, who was accompanied by his wife, when I asked about his parents, he said, my mom is 60 and very well, and my dad is 64 and in good health, and I have no siblings. Then his wife surprisingly interrupted him and asked, didn't your dad have heart surgery many years ago? He replied, oh yes, he had heart surgery when he was in his mid-40s for blocked arteries. Keep in mind, if someone's getting a bypass surgery in their mid-40s or 50s, it means their coronary artery disease started at a very young age to get that severe by mid-40s, requiring surgery. Returning to our patient, I asked, tell me about your father's siblings. He looked at his wife and said, I actually had two uncles who died in their 40s, but I was young. His wife added bluntly, they both had a heart attack. Now, after some probing and with assistance from his wife, the family history has evolved from a benign mom and dad are fine to revealing a very strong history of ischemic heart disease on the father's side. This significantly alters the equation, suggesting a familial form of hypercholesterolemia. Such history might easily be overlooked during a hurried visit, particularly if the patient were alone, which highlights the importance of obtaining a corroborative history. The next step in our approach is looking for the physical signs of familial hypercholesterolemia. Some individuals with FH may have specific physical signs that indicate cholesterol buildup in certain areas. The cholesterol accumulation in the tendons can create palpable and sometimes painful lumps known as xanthomas. A hallmark physical sign of FH is the development of xanthomas within the Achilles tendon resulting in palpable lumps behind the ankles. Around the eyes, similar deposits are termed xanthalasmus. Another notable sign is arcus corneellus, a white or grayish ring around the cornea. This can be especially telling when found in younger individuals. It's critical to remember that while these signs can support the diagnosis of FH, their absence does not exclude familial hypercholesterolemia. In the final step, we use the FH calculator. This tool takes all the information we gathered in the previous steps to generate a score. The most common calculator used is the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network or Dutch Lipid Score. The higher the score, the greater the likelihood of having FH. Those with scores 1 to 2 are unlikely to have FH. Scores 3 to 5 are possible FH. Scores 6 to 8 are probable FH and score more than 8 are categorized as definite FH. Here, you can see an example of an FH calculator, which can be accessed at the HeartCare Sydney website. In the next slide, we show you how to use the calculator using the information from our patient. Here we are live on the HeartCare Sydney website, the FH calculator page. If we scroll down the 
first section in the calculator is family history and the first question is there a first degree relative with known premature coronary artery disease which he does have his father with coronary artery disease the next question is there any child under 18 with high cholesterol he has a child with significantly elevated cholesterol the answer is yes the next section is clinical history we still don't know whether he has coronary artery disease he hasn't been investigated so it, the answer is unknown for him in this case and he doesn't have cerebral or per uh, peripheral vascular disease the next section is physical exam he does have arcus cornealis uh, so the answer is yes, but he doesn't have tendon xanthoma. Answer is no. The next section is LDL cholesterol. In millimole per liter, uh, you can convert milligram per deciliter to millimole per liter here. His cholesterol was 10 millimole per liter and he was not taking a statin. The answer is no, but he, if he was taking a statin, we choose yes and the medication that he was taking at the time. And the last section is genetic testing. He hasn't had genetic testing and we calculate. And as we can see, he has a score of 15, which is categorized as definite FH. Through a detailed stepwise process, we've clinically established that our seemingly healthy 38-year-old patient is highly likely to have familial hypercholesterolemia. This diagnosis is crucial, impacting not just him, but also his children who have a 50% chance of inheriting this condition. Given this context, the next consideration is genetic testing, which raises an important question. Why opt for genetic testing when the clinical evidence strongly points to FH? Let's explore the key reasons why proceeding with genetic testing is crucial in cases of suspected FH. One. Confirmation of diagnosis. Genetic testing provides definitive confirmation of FH, especially when clinical indicators strongly suggest the condition but aren't conclusive. 2. Facilitating cascade screening. Once a genetic mutation is identified in a patient, it allows for more targeted and specific cascade screening of family members. This approach is more precise than relying solely on lipid levels and can identify affected relatives who may not yet show symptoms or only have borderline lipid levels. 3. Understanding disease severity. Different mutations associated with FH have varying levels of disease severity. Identifying the specific mutation can guide more personalized treatment strategies, although much more work is required in this area. 4. Access to new treatments. A confirmed genetic diagnosis can be instrumental in securing insurance coverage for advanced treatments such as PCSK9 inhibitors. 5. Psychological closure. For many patients and families, having a confirmed genetic diagnosis provides a sense of closure and aids in understanding the condition and improving adherence to treatment. 6. Contribution to research. Contributing genetic data to registries and research databases enhances the overall understanding of FH, potentially leading to improved treatments in the future. Our patient chose to undergo genetic testing to confirm his diagnosis. We currently perform two types of genetic testing. The first is a diagnostic test, which aims to confirm FH in individuals with a high likelihood of the disease, like our patient. The second type is cascade testing, offered to the first and second degree relatives of individuals who have tested positive for mutations through a diagnostic test. Currently, four genes are tested, LDLR, PCSK9, APOB, and LDLR AP1. However, about 90% of FH cases are attributed to mutations in the LDL receptor gene, which is essential for manufacturing and ensuring the proper function of LDL receptors. For the cost to be covered by Medicare, at least one of the following criteria must be met. The patient must have a Dutch lipid score of 6 or above, an LDL cholesterol level of 6.5 millimoles per liter or higher, or an LDL cholesterol level above 5 millimoles per liter in the presence of coronary artery disease, CAD. 
Thus, anyone with an LDL cholesterol of 7, even in the absence of CAD, would qualify for a Medicare rebate. Our patient, with an LDL cholesterol of 10.5, is certainly eligible for the test. Now, let's review the results of the genetic test. This test was conducted for diagnostic purposes. Our patient had two criteria for Medicare rebate. His LDL cholesterol level was above 6.5 millimoles per liter, and his Dutch lipid score was 15, significantly higher than the minimum requirement of 6. The test analyzed four genes, revealing a mutation in the LDL receptor gene, which is most commonly associated with FH. It's crucial to note that even in definite clinical cases of FH, like that of our patient, there's a 10 to 20% chance of a negative genetic test result. This could be due to polygenic factors or unknown gene mutations. These patients are still at very high risk for premature ischemic heart disease, and their management plan should be pursued with the same level of intensity and vigilance. Let's see how a mutation in the LDL receptor gene can raise LDL cholesterol. LDL receptors on the surface of cells, including liver cells, play a key role in cholesterol management. They bind to LDL particles circulating in the blood and facilitate their uptake into the cells, effectively reducing the LDL cholesterol level in the bloodstream. However, mutations in the LDLR gene disrupt this process in two ways. Firstly, it can lead to a reduced number of LDL receptors. Secondly, it can cause the creation of defective receptors, which cannot effectively bind to the LDL particles. Both of these issues lead to decreased clearance of LDL particles, causing them to accumulate in the bloodstream, ultimately resulting in an increase in LDL cholesterol levels. Before investigating our patient for potential premature coronary artery disease, we should check another important risk factor, lipoprotein A, which is a particle structurally similar to LDL, with some differences. They both contain the ApoB protein. However, LPA has an additional protein called ApoA. Research indicates that elevated LPA is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease impacting around 20% of the population. The LPA gene controls the LPA level and its production, making it essential to check LPA levels at least once in individuals with a strong family history of heart disease. Some would even go further and recommend that everyone should have their LPA levels checked at least once in their lifetime. Normal LPA levels fall below 30 mg per deciliter, while levels above 50 are considered significantly elevated. In the case of our patient, his LPA level was a strikingly high 132 mg per deciliter. These severely elevated LPA levels, combined with his FH diagnosis, significantly increase his risk for early-onset ischemic heart disease and sudden cardiac death, particularly if left untreated. Given his family history and our recent findings, our patient underwent a stress test to specifically check for severe coronary artery disease, and I emphasize the term severe. It's crucial to understand that functional tests like stress ECGs or stress echocardiograms mainly detect severe, flow-limiting coronary blockages. They are less sensitive when it comes to identifying mild or moderate blockages. He exercised on the treadmill, Roos protocol. For nearly 10 minutes, he experienced significant fatigue but no chest pain. However, the exercise ECG told a different story. It showed clear signs of ischemia, suggesting the presence of substantial obstructive disease that could be limiting blood flow to the heart muscle during exertion. Following the stress test, a coronary angiogram was performed, which showed severe triple vessel coronary artery disease which also involved his left main artery. Given the presence of ischemia, FH diagnosis, and his significant family history, coronary artery bypass surgery was recommended. Our patient agreed to proceed with this course of treatment. A common misconception I encounter is the belief that patients are fixed after coronary revascularization, be it through bypass surgery or stenting. 
In reality, this is far from the truth and can lead to clinical inertia and suboptimal care. Patients who have undergone these procedures remain at high risk for life and require intensive, long-term medical therapy to prevent further cardiovascular events. The key goals in our patients' care include excellent LDL control. We aim for an LDL level below 1.4 millimoles per liter, 55 milligrams per deciliter, targeting even lower levels for high-risk individuals, the lower the better. Lifestyle modifications. Significant lifestyle changes are necessary, focusing on adopting a healthy diet and regular physical activity. Family screening. Early detection of FDH in as children is crucial, which I will discuss in the following slides. Lastly remains the challenge of his elevated LPA levels, which are not responsive to statin therapy and are only modestly affected by PCSK9 inhibitors. However, we are hopeful as new medications specifically targeting LPA are on the horizon, promising more effective management of this risk factor. Our patient was started on high-intensity statin therapy with rusuvastatin 40 mg, combined with azetimide 10 mg daily. Although he responded well after three months, his LDL cholesterol levels remained well above our target of 1.4 millimoles per liter. A few months into the treatment, we encountered a new challenge. His liver function tests began showing abnormalities. Both AST and ALT levels were elevated to more than three times the normal range. In response, we made the decision to reduce the dose of the statin. After we reduced the Rusuva statin dosage to 20 mg, there was a noticeable improvement in his liver function tests. However, this adjustment unfortunately resulted in a further increase in his LDL cholesterol levels, which rose to 5.1 millimoles per liter. At this point, the criteria for starting PCSK9 inhibitors under Medicare were met. For eligibility, a patient's LDL cholesterol must be above 1.8 millimoles per liter, despite being on the maximally tolerated combination of a statin and azetimide. He was then started on monthly injections of evolucumab, Repatha, a PCSK9 inhibitor, in addition to his current regimen. This combination effectively lowered his LDL cholesterol to 1.5 millimoles per liter, very close to the target. Despite this intensive therapy, his LPA levels, which were initially 132 mg per deciliter, remained persistently elevated at 137. This highlights the fact that LPA is an independent risk factor that requires specific treatments. Fortunately, targeted therapies for reducing LPA levels will soon be available for such high-risk patients. Family screening is essential in cases like our patients, where there's a diagnosis of FH coupled with aggressive coronary artery disease. FH is an autosomal dominant disorder, meaning each child has a 50% chance of inheriting it from an affected parent. Our patient's 11-year-old son was found to have significant hypercholesterolemia. Given the severity of the disease in the family, they decided to start him on treatment. It's important to emphasize that it's never too soon to start treatment in such cases. The key is to begin as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed, aiming to prevent the early onset of severe disease. His father had severe coronary disease at 38. This process didn't start at 38. It started when he was born. Therefore, it is never too soon for his affected children to start treatment. Here are a few points about screening in children. Children of patients with confirmed FH should be tested for hypercholesterolemia as early as age 5. Genetic testing in children is recommended only if one of the parents has genetically confirmed familial hypercholesterolemia, an LDL cholesterol level of more than 5 millimoles per liter, 195 milligrams per deciliter, in a child with an affected parent is considered a definite FH diagnosis. Remember that two separate samples are required for confirmation. Treatment should commence as soon as the diagnosis is made or from the age of 10. Remember that early treatment is crucial to manage this condition effectively 
and reduce the risk of early cardiovascular disease in these children. In this presentation, we've discussed various aspects of approaching and managing severe hypercholesterolemia. Let's recap the crucial takeaways. 1. Stepwise approach. It's important to systematically address hypercholesterolemia to ensure conditions such as FH are not missed. Utilize all available tools, including the FH calculator, for a comprehensive evaluation. 2. Role of genetic testing. Genetic testing can aid in confirming the diagnosis of FH. However, genetic testing is not mandatory to confirm the diagnosis or start treatment. Remember that genetic testing may yield negative results in 10 to 20% of patients with FH. 3. Early treatment. Early intervention in hypercholesterolemia, particularly in FA patients with a strong family history of premature coronary disease, is vital in preventing early onset atherosclerosis. There's no such thing as too soon to start treatment. 4. Healthy lifestyle and weight management. It is essential to maintain a healthy lifestyle and weight for effective management of hypercholesterolemia and other health-related conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. 5. Assessing LPA levels. LPA levels should be checked at least once, especially in younger patients with a strong family history of ischemic heart disease. 6. Family screening. Do not overlook the importance of screening family members of patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. There's a 50% chance of children inheriting this disorder from an affected parent. And this will conclude our presentation. I hope you found it enjoyable and informative. In the next video, we will be discussing the significance of lipoprotein A. Please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons to stay up to date. Thank you for your attention.